Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. My name is Paul Harris and I'm president of the City Club's Board of Directors. I am privileged to introduce today's speaker, Martha Bergmark, founding executive director of Voices for Civil Justice. Ms. Bergmark's appearance today is timely and continues the City Club dialogue on justice. Yesterday, in a 56 to 43 vote, the United States Senate confirmed Loretta Lynch as the nation's next attorney general. <clears throat> what, 166 days after the president nominated her. In his post-confirmation remarks, the president commented that, quote, Loretta has spent her life fighting for fair and equal justice that is the foundation of our democracy, end quote. And on March 19, the day after the president appeared here at the City Club, the City Club hosted author and attorney Brian Stevenson. During his remarks, Mr. Stevenson stated that, quote, this country treats people better who are rich and guilty rather than those who are poor and innocent, end quote. Now, the issue of unequal access to civil justice is highlighted at the Voices for Civil Justice website, which states on the subject of civil legal aid that, quote, it is essential to fulfilling our nation's fundamental promise of justice for all, not just for the few who can afford it, end quote. For over four decades, our speaker has dedicated herself to the cause of civil justice in her home state of Mississippi and subsequently at a national level. Ms. Bergmark practiced civil rights and poverty law for 14 years in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, where she founded Southeast Mississippi Legal Services, now known as Mississippi Center for Legal Services. Just occurred to me, you didn't have a Southern accent when we were talking about this. So, uh -huh. oh, maybe you can comment on that. <clears throat> In our nation's capital, Ms. Bergmark served in leadership roles for the Legal Services Corporation, which administers federal funding for civil legal aid organizations. She also served in a leadership position for the National Legal Aid and Defender Association, where she directed the Project for the Future of Equal Justice, a joint effort with the Center for Law and Social Policy. In 2003, Ms. Bergmark received a grant to launch the Mississippi Center for Civil Justice, a civil league civil legal aid organization which has blossomed from a one desk operation to an organization with a staff of 35 people and an annual budget of 4.3 million dollars. She continues to serve as a board member and senior counsel for the center. And Ms. Berkmark recently founded Voices for Civil Justice of course which as stated at its website is quote a nonpartisan communications hub advancing fairness in America's legal system end quote. Now, I've highlighted our speaker's decades of excellence, but I'm going to close by noting that she also graduated with high honor from Oberlin College, so welcome back to Ohio. Understand you also have Cleveland connections, so you may talk about that too. <laughs> and with honor from the University of Michigan Law School, she holds honorary doctorates from Oberlin College and Millsaps College, which is in Jackson, Mississippi. So I am proud to present on behalf of the City Club of Cleveland, Martha Bergmark, founding executive director of Voices for Civil Justice. Good afternoon. Thank you for your generous introduction, Paul. Um, I want to say just how honored I am to be included in the City Club of Cleveland's impressive roster of speakers and programs. What a rich uh, menu you offer of opportunities for civic engagement and for education. Uh, you should be proud. You know how when we say the Pledge of Allegiance, we close with those words, justice for all. Justice for all. What do those words mean? Uh, is there uh, fairness in our justice system? Does everyone have access to it? I'm going to ask you to join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance this afternoon. I want you to think back to the, your surroundings when you first learned the pledge, sort of channel your inner first grader. Um, I can still remember the little flag on top of the blackboard at the front of the room. Um, and back then that flag had only 48 stars. Um, and I don't know about you, but I didn't understand much about the concepts in the pledge. But I do remember feeling that it must be important because we memorized it and we stood up together to say it out loud. So, okay, I'm going to ask us to do it. They've put this flag here for us to make it possible. Should we stand? I think we should stand, don't you? That's what we did in first grade. 
<laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I learned the pledge in a segregated public school in Jackson, Mississippi. It was 1954, the year that the Supreme Court handed down Brown v. Board of Education, the ruling that separate is not equal. But for the next dozen years, I continued to attend all white public schools uh, in Jackson. As I got older, the Civil Rights Movement heated up. The Klan waged a campaign of terror, killing people, burning homes and churches, all without fear of prosecution. It became hard not to notice that there was a huge disconnect between those inspiring words, justice for all, and the current reality around me. As a white child, I might have been less likely to notice this disconnect, but my parents were active in the civil rights movement, and as a teenager, so was I. So when it came time to choose a college to attend, the people who had most inspired me were students from Oberlin College who came to Mississippi to help register people to vote, to teach in freedom schools, to risk life and limb, actually, to give reality to the, that promise of justice for all. So I only applied to Oberlin and was lucky enough to make my way to Northern Ohio. And from there, it was just a quick hop, stick, skip, and a jump to Cleveland uh, for a coveted summer internship as a cub reporter at the Plain Dealer. Now, at that time, in 1969, almost half a century ago, ago, most ordinary Clevelanders who needed to go to court in a serious civil matter, a child custody matter or a uh, bankruptcy, did so with the help of a lawyer. But today, across America, in 80 to 90 percent of civil cases in the civil courts, one or both parties are there alone, without a lawyer, without help to navigate legal, uh, complicated legal proceedings that often have life-changing <laughs> consequences, like protection from abuse or losing the roof over one's head. This dramatic turnaround represents a pretty uh, wholesale retreat from our national promise of justice for all. And it's a crisis for middle-class Amer uh, middle Americans, not just for those who are struggling to make ends meet. It's a crisis that affects all of us. I want to let you in on a best-kept secret that is the key to addressing this crisis. And that secret is civil legal aid. Civil legal aid helps ensure that when we pledge allegiance to a nation of justice for all, we really mean justice for all, not just the few who can afford it. Today, I want to talk with you about the importance of civil legal aid and share a story about a woman who, with the assistance of the Legal Aid Society of Cleveland, found a resilience within herself that she didn't know she had and turned her life around. At Voices for Civil Justice, the nonpartisan organization that I run, we are committed to advancing fairness in the justice system here in Cleveland, in Ohio, across America. And in case you're sitting there thinking, well, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a judge, I'm not a journalist, this is something for someone else to worry about, I want everyone in this room to leave the room today knowing that you have a cr crucial role to play right now uh, in addressing this crisis. So what is civil legal aid and why does it matter? Most people don't know much at all about civil legal aid. Most people are familiar with that cut show catch phrase, if you can't afford a lawyer, one will be provided for you. But they don't realize that while there is a constitutional right to legal counsel when your liberty is at stake in a criminal case, there is no such right in a civil matter. Most people have no idea that you can lose your children, you can lose your home, you can lose your livelihood without having access to legal help to get through complicated legal proceedings. 
So civil legal aid provides people with a combination of services and resources so they can protect their families, their homes, their livelihoods. The range of services includes full-scale legal assistance and representation in complex cases, self-help centers so that you can go in and help yourself through a case if you're able to do so, information online and forms to know your rights and be able to defend your rights. Civil Legal Aid helps people who are facing potentially life-changing circumstances. A mother who is trying to escape domestic violence but needs a court order to protect her, to protect her and to get custody of her children. An elderly person who may be facing homelessness because of an unlawful eviction or foreclosure. A veteran who's been unable to access benefits that he has earned. Civil legal aid helps ensure fairness for all in America's justice system, regardless of how much money a person has. The numbers help us understand the magnitude of this problem right here in Cleveland and around the country. country. The number of people who are eligible because of their low incomes to receive the help of a civil legal aid program is at least 64 million. In any given year, an additional 30 million or so may be experiencing a temporary bad patch and likewise would be eligible to have assistance with counsel. That amounts to almost one in three Americans who may find themselves eligible for civil legal aid. Now, does every such person have a serious legal problem every year? No, of course not, thank goodness. But when they do, a recent study has shown that civil legal aid programs are forced to turn away two out of three eligible people who come to them for help because of a lack of resources. And to put that in, uh, in perspective, if you are the one who gets help in that situa situation, Turn to the person on your left and the person on your right, and they are going to be left out. With such a drastic disconnect between supply and demand, it's only fair to ask, uh, are we responding appropriately to that? The legal industry in this country generates about $270 billion in revenue each year. Yet we currently dedicate just $1.3 billion to provide civil legal aid. I'll save you doing the math, that is less than one half of one percent. We spend a mere one half of one percent of the entire legal sector resources to meet the serious legal needs of up to a third of the population. That leaves the balance of, of justice, the scales of justice, pretty seriously unbalanced. And this imbalance helps explain what I started with or earlier, that in 80 to 90 percent of cases in the civil courts, one or both parties are there without a lawyer. Across the state courts, our, our, our reporting, our state courts are reporting an explosion in the numbers of what we call unrepresented litigants, people who are trying to navigate complicated legal proceedings without help or representation. So these numbers are not pretty, but how does that crisis actually play out in the lives of real people? There is no one better able than the lawyers and their clients at the Legal Aid Society of Cleveland to help us understand that. Let me tell you about a Cleveland woman who did get the legal help she needed and how it changed her life. When Isla Atkins first walked through the doors of the Legal Aid Society, she was a frightened, young mother. A foster child from the age of 13, Isla married and became pregnant at 19. In short order, she was the mother of two and the anxiety of her dissolving marriage fueled her worsening alcoholism. She knew she had to make a change for the sake of her children. A friend referred her to legal aid for help in getting a divorce and she met legal aid attorney Alexandria Rudin a specialist in helping women safely leave abusive marriages. Isla remembers that Alexandria not only focused on resolving her legal problems, but challenged her to consider her and her children's long-term future. No one had ever done that. Isla credits Alexandria for her decision to go to college and later to law school. 
Today, Alexandria is still at the Legal Aid Society, still helping women who find themselves in Isla's situation. And Isla is now an in-house counsel at Scott Fetzler in Westlake. She has been a board member of the Legal Aid Society and a board chair. And she said, I never want to forget where I came from. I want to make sure the door to legal aid is always open behind me. Isla and Alexandria give practical meaning to the words justice for all. They exemplify the resilience that civil legal aid makes possible in the lives of so many. And Alexandria is with us today. So join me in saying thank you, Alexandria, to you. When most people in Isla's situation, up to nine out of 10 people, must do without the legal help and mentoring that Isla got, that's what I mean by a crisis threatening our civil justice system. Now, having sketched out that rather bleak, uh, you know, dimensions, uh, the bleak dimensions of this crisis, I want to quickly turn to the recent developments and trends that give me hope that we can and we will change this picture. We've got public opinion on our side. We've got momentum with real game-changing delivery innovations and the support of unusual partners, uh, credible and powerful new partners. And there's a remarkable opening for reform on the criminal justice side of our very interconnected justice system. As I mentioned earlier, most people have little awareness of civil legal aid, but when they are educated on the topic, they are highly supportive. More than 80% of people believe it's important, in fact critical, to have legal help to get through the complexities of the civil justice system. That support ranks right up there with mom and apple pie. A healthy majority, 57%, when they're presented with arguments both for and against, uh, think we ought to increase funding for civil legal aid. So we have an important untold story to tell and a receptive audience that's ready to hear it. We're also experiencing, experiencing right now an unprecedented creativity and innovation in the ways that we deliver legal help. I mentioned that the courts are experiencing this heavy load of unrepresented litigants. Increasingly judges, and especially our state Supreme Court chief justices, the leaders of our 50 state jurisdictions, are seeing this not just as a problem of courtroom management and administration, you know, bollocksing up their works for a system that's designed for lawyers, but uh, is populated increasingly by people who don't have legal help, but they're seeing it really as a threat to their main reason for being, which is, of course, equal justice under law. Ohio Supreme Court Chief Justice Maureen O'Connor is a good example of the judicial leadership that we will be needed to implement the necessary reforms. And next week, she will convene Ohio's Access to Justice Summit to consider and act on the recommendations of the Supreme Court Task Force on, on Access to Justice that she appointed last year. Courts around the country are stepping up to provide information services, such as plain language forms, self-help centers, informational clinics, or what we call court-based legal aid. At courthouses and in legal aid offices, we're seeing innovative uses of technology to increase efficiency. And some states are starting to permit non-lawyers to provide certain types of help at lower cost. Happily, all these important improvements in delivery mean that when we say we need to be able to help three to five times the number of people, it does not mean we need three to five times the money to do it. Solving our crisis in the civil justice system will include a combination of new resources and new efficiencies in delivery. New efficiencies that we actually already know quite a lot about how to implement. You may have seen the recent media coverage of uh, the Koch Industries and the Koch Brothers, those icons of the right, partnering up with the ACLU and the Center for American Progress, standard bearers on the left, to implement criminal justice reforms and reduce prison populations. Now this initiative didn't spring, spring up out of nowhere. 
Uh, our mass incarceration crisis has been steadily worsening for decades. Uh, but this hopeful partnership of strange bedfellows, I think, is a signal that perhaps our criminal justice system has reached a true breaking point. Earlier I mentioned the widespread misperception that if you can't afford a lawyer, one will be provided for you. That's not true in civil cases, even when dire, life-changing consequences can result, as I mentioned. But as the situation in Ferguson, Missouri, and elsewhere has recently exposed, our civil and criminal justice systems are closely intertwined, and misuse and abuse on both sides can trap people in cycles of impoverishment and imprisonment. So the fix needs to be comprehensive. That brings me to my work at Voices for Civil Justice, the new national communications hub for civil legal aid. At Voices, our mission is to raise visibility in the media about civil legal aid. People understand that in a potentially life-changing situation, like a wrongful eviction or a petition for protection from domestic abuse, everyone deserves access to legal help. And our job at Voices is to get that story out there. And here's how we do it. we're doing it. First, we know that there are ongoing national conversations in the mainstream press, in the social media, around our kitchen tables and water coolers about important issues like access to health care, same-sex marriage, unaccompanied children at the border, income inequality, and a threat to the middle class. In all these issues and more, civil legal aid lawyers are making a difference every day, but they're only rarely included in the media coverage. Too often, reporters paint a dark picture of the plight facing American families, but they fail to mention that proven programs are already making an impact and could make an even big, bigger impact with adequate resources. So for the past year, we've been making a concerted effort to bring legal aid's role to light. We provide journalists with new untold stories. Uh, we offer them new spokespeople and sources. And these efforts are starting to pay off with pieces so far in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, NBC News, USA Today and others, more than 50 placements so far. And this week's uh, New Yorker has a, a piece on unaccompanied children at the border that features a civil legal aid lawyer in Texas. We're getting the message out as well on Facebook and Twitter. We're recruiting and training a network of spokespeople and messengers, and not just legal aid lawyers and their clients, although certainly included are those, but also judges business civi and civic leaders, people like you. In Cleveland, we're fortunate to work with two of the best in the business, Legal Aid Society of Cleveland's Executive Director, Colleen Cotter, and Communications Director, Melanie Shikarian. Colleen and Melanie, I wish we could clone you. Uh, you and your colleagues are a shining example of the difference that civil legal aid makes in everyday people's lives. Colleen told me that when the Legal Aid Society started their first fundraising campaign several years ago, she was most surprised by your surprise that they didn't already have what they needed to do their jobs. Because no one had asked for your help, you assumed it wasn't needed. I don't want to make that mistake today. So in closing, I'd like to leave you with this. When I was a cub reporter at the Plain Dealer in 1969, I got a crash course in the character of Cleveland. When America put a man on the moon that summer, I did a story about the important ro role of Cleveland's NASA Research Center. Cleveland was making Carl Stokes a nationwide newsmaker as the first black mayor of a major American city. The Cuyahoga River caught fire. <laughs> and sparked a national environmental movement. In Cleveland, with your famous can-do, we're all in this together spirit, and your proud civic institutions like the Legal Aid Society and the City Club, you are poised to help expose the crisis in our civil justice system and contribute to the diverse array of solutions. But the Legal Aid Society cannot do it alone. 
the 90% of Americans who are going it alone in our civil courts need all of our help to raise awareness of the fact that how many are actually denied the help they need, to educate the people we know who can make a difference, to contribute volunteer time and dollars. Cleveland, Ohio, America need the help and the leadership of everyone in this room to fulfill our nation's inspiring but still unmet promise of justice for all. Thank you. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we are enjoying a Friday Forum featuring Martha Bergmark, founding executive director of Voices for Civil Justice. We encourage you to start formulating questions now for our traditional City Club Q&A session and remind you that your questions should be brief and to the point. We welcome all of you here and those joining us via 90.3 WCPN, WVIZ PBS, 104.9 WCLV are one of the many radio stations across the country that carry City Club programs. Television broadcasts of the City Club are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC and our live webcasts are supported by the University of Akron. Please join us this coming Tuesday, April 28th for David Michaels, MPH, PhD, Assistant Secretary of Labor for Occupational Safety and Health. For more information about our upcoming and past forums, please visit us online at cityclub.org. Today's forum is the Sidney D. Joseph's Memorial Forum on the Bill of Rights, made possible by a special gift from the Joseph's family. We thank you all for your support. And we welcome guests at the tables hosted today by the Legal Aid Society of Cleveland and the St. Luke's Foundation, and we thank you too for your support. Now, as promised, we'll return to our speaker for our City Club question and answer period. We welcome questions from everyone here today, including guests. Holding the microphones today are City Club Associate Wesley Allen, there's Wesley, and Content Associate Teddy Eisenberg. First question, please. First of all, thank you for your efforts and for uh, trying to get this issue on the radar screen of public opinion in this country as one of the major problems that we uh, are facing in our society. I'm glad to know of your organization. I wanted to ask you about uh, volunteers as one resource that perhaps could be expanded, utilization of which could be expanded to um, leverage the expertise of lawyers who are paid to do this work and who do it wonderfully, but who have only limited uh, time. And I'm thinking particularly, and this is very personal with me, of lawyers who are retired or in the process of retiring. And uh, I've had the feeling that that population is grossly underutilized in regard to this kind of, of service. I would like to know whether you agree with that and whether you have any thoughts about what can be done uh, structurally, organizationally, or in other ways to not only agree that it would be a good thing if we had more volunteers, but to make it, to make it happen. And perhaps as a result of a na being head of a national organization, maybe you're becoming aware of best practices around the country in this regard that we could even emulate here in a place like Cleveland. Thank you. Thank you. I certainly agree that more can and should be done to utilize volunteer uh, help effectively. I can say that in the civil legal aid sector over the last 30 years, we have made a lot of improvements in, in how we do that, and, and upwards of 10% of the or so of the services we provide are provided with the help of volunteers. It could be more, uh, but, it's, but, but a baseline is there. I will say, too, that there needs to be not just the, the outpouring of volunteer hours to help and willingness to help 
there needs to be a delivery uh, infrastructure to receive that help, and that's not free uh, either. So, so an investment there is important. But I think one of the things that the civil legal aid sector is doing to really uh, help address the fact that we're grossly under-resourced is to diversify our portfolio of funding. We do, and funding and support, so, so volunteer support uh, comes with that as well. At Voices, we are seeking to tell that part of the story. So some of our messengers are those pro bono uh, volunteers and folks at law firms around the country or who are helping to, to deliver the services. So thanks very much. Uh, have most of your efforts in terms of helping the foreign-born been concentrated on what's going on at the border? Well, legal aid program. There are about 600 legal aid programs around the country, in in every state and in every community, and virtually all states have at least a program or maybe more than one program who provide some kind of services to immigrants. The unaccompanied children at the border problem is one, obviously, that that exploded into public awareness last summer. Uh, but it's certainly not the that was not a surprise to legal aid lawyers who were doing that work already. Um, and they and services have been provided to immigrants that way. You may be or have some knowledge that uh, there are cert again diversifying the portfolio is a good thing uh, for another reason in that um, certain kinds of funding are restricted. There are certain kinds of public funding, for example, uh, have been restricted from use to assist immigrants. Uh, but that that's. Uh, Public funding accounts for not quite two thirds of the total 1.3 billion that I mentioned, um, and the rest uh, does does include service to to immigrants. You talked about the uh, article in the New York Times about unhealthy apartments. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about some of the other stories that you're seeing nationally where sure. people need civil legal aid? Okay. Uh, you know, one of the things I'm learning, I'm not a communications professional, even though I had this little minute at the, uh, at the plane dealer. I have lived a career as a legal aid lawyer and a civil rights lawyer. Uh, but I'm learning that what our task is, is to, we know, we legal aid folks know that we're involved in so many of the, the issues that are of concern and that, and that are part of the national conversation. Uh, and our job is to just elevate them into, into being exposed there and covered there and having legal aid uh, lawyers and clients and others be uh, spokespeople and experts on those issues. Some of the issues that have come to our attention just in the past year include the crisis in veterans uh, benefits and access to veterans benefits, the rise in evictions. We've, we've you know, evicted, we've put five million uh, households out of their homes with foreclosures, so not surprising that we're seeing uh, crisis in the, in the private housing market, in the rental market, uh, and, we're, and legal aid is very much a part of that issue around the country. Access to health care, again, a, a huge issue in the national conversation, and yet I, I want to mention one real innovation that has happened and that we've been able to get some coverage on right here in Cleveland is your medical legal partnership. The idea that people don't necessarily present their first problem in a legal aid office. They may show up in their local public health clinic. Um, legal, medical legal partnerships were invented in Boston uh, by a doctor, who, a pediatrician, who was having trouble b with asthma and, and you know medicating his patients and so forth, giving inhalers and whatnot, and no, no help was really coming for them. And it turned out it was their living environments, the, the mold and rat infestations and others that were prompting those asthma problems. And he realized what these children needed was a lawyer, not a doctor, or as in addition to a doctor. Um, so what he invented really was a system of combining the service in the medical clinic so that, that lawyers were there to help. And we were able to get NBC News uh, in plain sight uh, to cover Cleveland's medical legal uh, partnership, which goes back several years. It's a, it's a longstanding program, but one that had really received little uh, coverage in the media. If I remember correctly, and if I don't, I'm sure you'll correct me. <clears throat> in the 70s, uh, legal aid enjoyed a tremendous amount of success in pursuing class actions 
to remedy some of the, or at least attack some of the problems that you're referring to today. Uh, our conservative friends saw that that was put an end to by restricting your finance, funding so you can't spend money on class actions. And my question is, how much of an impediment do you find that restriction to be in seeking the remedies that you've described? In the mid-90s, when the series of restrictions came into being on the federal money, on the, on the congressionally appropriated money, that included both the class action restriction you mentioned and a series of other restrictions, and the severe cutback in funding at that time, I think legal aid programs were remarkably creative and innovative in really going out and raising other resources to support their work. Uh, such that today, the, the, main, the main funding, the, one, the single one biggest funder of civil legal aid is the federal government through the Legal Services Corporation. Uh, but that represents just about 22% of the total 1.3 billion that I mentioned now, 22%. So the fairly small percentage. Uh, other public money includes state money, some of which carries some of those same restrictions, and often the public money will be restricted. But uh, over a third of the money that comes to legal aid comes from private sources, usually unrestricted. So, I, you know, the, the restrictions are, are going to change from year to year, and they're going to depend on the, on the politics. Uh, and, but, and yet, I think civil legal aid, in order to grow and thrive, is going to have to recognize that different funders are going to want to do different things with their money. Uh, I'm not for those restrictions. I happen to be president of the Legal Services Corporation at the time those restrictions came into being, and certainly uh, we, I personally would love to see them roll back. But I think we have found ways, innovative ways, and legal ways, you know, importantly doing what our funders uh, tell us to do, uh, to address the problem. So, so class actions are uh, happening around the country and important impact work is going on. In fact, that's, that's the thing that our journalist friends are most eager to cover is, is some of the innovative um, impact uh, work and policy work that, that our programs do continue to do. Ms. Bergmark, I was troubled by one comment this notion of plain language, mm -hmm. the practice of law. <laughs> <laughs> Do your part to extirpate that. <laughs> I have often mentioned small claims court to clients, I'm a lawyer, as something where a small matter might go. I've never been to one. I, I don't really know how they work. I'm surprised there isn't a TV show about it, because it must be pretty interesting. Uh, but I have begun to hear about specialized courts of various kinds, drug courts. I know a little bit about a housing court. And it, it seems to me that the small claims court model is an interesting one, where the society says, gosh, we do have some small scale uh, matters that should be allowed to go forward without lawyers, but where people speak their own heart. The judge helps manage the courtroom and make sense of the proceedings. But it's uh, a, a simple forum uh, conducted ideally at low expense. It is the small claims court model something that we should be trying to expand? I think it's one of the things we should be looking at. And I think it's exciting that our court systems increasingly are taking on this issue, not as a matter of, of efficient court administration, but thinking of, the, of it in terms of an access to justice uh, issue from the perspective of ordinary Americans, and that ordinary Americans need a variety of kinds of, of help to access the justice system. So in those states where especially state Supreme Court chief judges are stepping up to help out their legal aid uh, colleagues and, and be part of the same effort to make a change, those things are starting to happen. Um, we're seeing the specialty courts is one way. We're seeing the idea of self-help centers in courthouses. California is really the leader on this. Every county in California has within it a self-help center to help a person 
navigate that system and with access to a lawyer where that's where that's needed not not for representation but for um, you know finding their way through the through the court maze so small claims courts as you know have often been outside of the uh, the the uh, courts the the big court system as we sometimes call it uh, and yet increasingly I think that's where we're going to have to find that sort of retail uh, justice and ways to deliver justice on a retail basis that that really work. Thanks. <clears throat> Ms. Burton. Young lawyers are groomed to be great lawyers when they enter law firms. They're taught attention to detail, diligence, uh, signature page management, and even how to balance an appetizer plate and a cocktail while shaking hands at a networking forum. <laughs> But each state's bar association has an aspirational requirement of pro bono service by lawyers. At what point in time do we instill this at the top of law firms? At what point in time do we mandate that that be integrated into the process of grooming a young lawyer into a great lawyer? And is it time for referendum on the, on the lack and the neglect of attention to this pro bono service aspiration? You know, it's actually not required in most states that uh, that law students do pro bono work, but some law schools ha have mandated it, and New York has uh, pioneered the idea of requiring 50 hours of pro bono service in order to get your license to begin with. In addition to taking your bar exam, you you donate 50 hours of time uh, before you're licensed. Uh, so certainly that is going to be one of the things, and, and at some point we're going to need to get to the point where we just make a big long list of all of the possible uh, approaches that, that states and law schools can have, and that would be on my uh, list, uh, my to-do list. Um, at the same time, I don't think that just uh, working around the edges with more volunteers, as wonderful as that is and as much a part of the system as it should be, is truly going to get us to address the magnitude of the crisis that I see that we have. We're, we're at some point going to have to get really serious about uh, what is the amount of money we really need to be investing in civil legal aid and how are we going to make that how are we going to make that happen? Uh, partly, and and add up the add up the uh, the pieces. If we could get volunteer time and effort to really be representing maybe up to a third of the people who need help, we could be using law schools better. At this point, though, we have a very balkanized. It's you know every of the each one of the fifty states has its own approach, and then in each state we've got several legal aid programs and you know complicated court systems and justices that may or may not yet be fully on board with we ought to be part of this problem. So I think part of, for, for my two cents worth, we are seeking to really raise awareness, to start to begin to talk about this as one of the crises. And I always, I sort of hated to come here at your lunchtime and put another serious, horrible crisis on your plate. God, isn't isn't uh, global warming enough, you know? Uh, <laughs> And yet, I also wanted to put there the idea that there are some real solutions and some real innovations in place that obviously we need to take them to scale. We need to do it not law school by law school or even state by state, uh, but, but comprehensively learn from each other and do it better. Martha, thank you so much for joining us here today. Um, I'm going to add another crisis onto everybody's uh -huh. plate, if that's OK. Um, our, our board president, uh, Paul Harris, mentioned Brian Stevenson's work mm -hmm. and his visit to Cleveland in March. And Stevenson puts very much at the center of his mission uh, equality regarding race. And um, you haven't talked very much about race, though given that uh, legal aid societies across the country are providing services to the poor, by and large, and given the demographics of poverty in our nation, um, there's, there's race at the heart of all of this. And I want to invite you to talk about that a little bit and about the, the mission that, uh, and, and the work, the very important work of breaking down the structural racism that exists in our country and, um, and how difficult that can be, but how important that can be. I, I want to hear from you on that. Dan, I really welcome the opportunity to do that. As a Mississippian, 
uh, and uh, having worked much of my career in Mississippi, I you are singing right to the choir in terms of the notion that race is at the very heart of what needs to happen in order for justice for all to be a reality. It was certainly not news to civil legal aid lawyers when the, the Justice Department r report broke or about Ferguson, Missouri, that there was racial disparity uh, in the ways that this system of uh, municipal court fine collection was being used at, really as a, as a fundraising tool for the courts with burden of that put certainly on, on low-income people, but very disproportionately on uh, people of color. Similarly, we were one of the one of the major sort of media hits we've gotten in the last two or three weeks has been a report that came out of California that some four million Californians had have had their driver's license suspended because of small uh, fines and so forth. Uh, and then and then those fines gets really really jacked up. You know, a, a very small traffic uh, offense in California can almost immediately result in a minimum of an $800 uh, payment that of course has, uh, has a much more disproportionate burden on low income folks um, than on others, uh, but also is, has been shown to be very uh, disproportionate in terms of its application to African Americans and, and Hispanics in California. So I think it's, you know, the, the extent to which our job at Voices is to begin to tell that story. I hope that we're telling that story as well, that this is a, you know, we, we in Mississippi recognize that this is a legacy that goes back hundreds of years that wasn't corrected when Jim Crow got abolished in the, in the 1960s and that has resonance today. And no one talks about it more eloquently than Brian Stevenson does. He was a colleague across the border in Alabama when I was at the Mississippi Center for Justice. He working more on the criminal side of the spectrum, we at the Mississippi Center working sort of more on the civil, and yet those cross over. So I think the, the attention to consequences of incarceration, I mean, first mass, mass incarceration period, but then once people get out of prison, the burdens that are put on them that are civil, often civil legal burdens, no longer within the criminal system, and yet impacting people in terms of their inability to get housing, their inability to maintain families because of the way child support is enforced, on and on and on, uh, obviously barriers to employment. Uh, so I do think that um, as tragic as the circumstances in Ferguson have, have been, that it is opening a window on and giving a moment in the national conversation that I hope we can prolong um, to give attention to those issues. So thank you for raising that. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your time and for your work. Uh, Two-part question. Uh, one, I'm wondering if there's data that suggests that the investment in civil, <clears throat> excuse me, civil legal aid services has a payoff, perhaps higher than every dollar that goes in. You get a couple dollars out. I suspect mm -hmm. that's the case. And also, I like to uh, leave meetings with a task list, a to-do okay. list. So if you could give me two or three things to do, as well as everybody in the room and everybody okay. listening and watching, so we know. Uh, what to do with the message you're giving today. Good. On the issue of, of return on investment, that is, return on investment studies are starting to be done by individual legal aid programs and by states um, and starting to be, have a dramatic payoff. So we're, they're, they're being done right now. The, the largest jurisdiction where one uh, has been done is at the statewide level. There's, a, there's not a national study to my knowledge but there have probably been over 20 states by now where return on investment studies are have been conducted, and they absolutely show that there's a payoff, that for every dollar invested in civil legal aid, broken down by, well, what's the impact in domestic violence, for example, or what's the impact with respect to preventing homelessness, what's the impact in uh, obtaining return on Social Security uh, benefits and others that some legal work can help to bring in to a to a community, and that range on on depending on the kind of case and depending on where 
it's being done, it's three dollars and up for every dollar. You know, it's it's a it's a it's high. You know, it's it's definitely uh, something we probably should have been looking at earlier to be able to show to our policymakers uh, that funding, you know, should, is a is a, this investment is an important one and a good one to be making. So there, so thank you for that. I don't, I actually don't know about Ohio, uh, but we can we can talk about whether that's been done yet in Ohio. Um, on your other to do, on your to do list, here's what I'd like you to do first. I'd like you to think of who that you know that you talk to around your dinner table or or at your workplace probably has no idea what civil legal aid is. I, I'm kind of shocked. I we hired a new communications associate recently. And I used it as a little focus group to say, have you, had you ever previously heard of civil legal aid? And only one out of seven of the people that we interviewed uh, had heard of civil legal aid. So first job is to please use that term. Civil legal aid should trip off your tongue in some upcoming conversation to say, really, did you know? Uh, and if not, would like you to know. Start to watch for that. Um, on that term, civil legal aid, we've had already had interactions with the copy desks at both the New York Times and the New Yorker. Uh, these guys are wonderfully good at what they do, but if they're not, you know, they if they don't know the term either, or if it's not kind of in usage, uh, it's not what they did. So I, I mentioned this California report about the driver's licenses uh, suspensions. Well, it was done by a consortium of legal aid programs in California, and the digital edition of the Times came out calling them civil rights groups. So this is before the print edition. So we were promptly on the phone to say, no, 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 civil legal aid. And they turned it around. So when it was in the paper the next day and, and it was corrected on the digital edition, it, it now mentions civil legal aid. So that's assignment one is see when you can use that term next. Um, two is to think about who in your circle, in your network of friends and colleagues, uh, might have influence on this question, and that could be that could be a private foundation uh, executive, uh, you know, who may or may not be funding civil legal aid uh, in their portfolio of grants. It could be it could be a policymaker uh, at the state, county, local, federal level who you're able to say, gee, I just went to a program on civil legal aid and I had no idea, blah, 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 but, you know, I, we're thinking about this. This is now on my list. So, so those would be two good things. And thirdly, Colleen Cotter is sitting right here and there are a number of other civil uh, legal aid society uh, folks around the room. Please introduce yourself to them and they've got a list for you. Uh, you uh, brought up the issue of um, uh, people being in prison for not paying child support. Yes. You know, the, the recent gentleman who was killed by the police in Oklahoma, one of the reasons they said he might have run away was because he thought he was going to get sent back to jail for not mm -hmm. paying child support. Where do you think we should find a balance around that issue, around this imprisonment? You want women to be supported and those children to be supported, but at the same time, should we be locking people up in prison for not doing that? There, we worked very hard on Shyla Dewan's recent New York Times story just last week about that uh, very issue. And it's, it's interesting how the politics of this one uh, have shifted. And I, I desperately hope that Walter Scott's death in South Carolina will at least have the effect, of the, the good effect of giving exposure to this very, very tough issue. It was, it's sort of a 90s thing to go after deadbeat dads and somehow this was going to be the solution uh, to, you know, supporting children in America. Um, I think that has started to shift somewhat. We do see civil legal aid programs around the country, mostly representing victims of domestic violence. I mean, you know, if you really look at the 30% or so of the caseload of, in American civil legal aid programs, they are by, the domestic relations work is largely on behalf of, of mostly women who are needing child support and, and so forth. But their legal aid programs are usually not going after deadbeat dads uh, because legal aid programs really get it. That uh, there's that's a very complicated. Uh, complicated thing to wade into. And even states are increasingly, I think, more sophisticated about 
uh, about this. So there certain states are not, South Carolina happens to be a state that has been very hard on imprisoning fathers without regard to what their real circumstances are or whether they really have ability to pay. And I think Walter Scott, you know, lost his life uh, because of that. Deserves more applause than that. Come on. <laughs> Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we have truly enjoyed a for Friday forum featuring Martha Bergmark, founding executive director of Voices for Civil Justice. Thank you very much. You know, at the City Club, we use the word civil in a different way, so, you know, there's a little bit of possible confusion there, but we understand the distinction between civil and criminal, but the interrelationship, too, between the two. So thank you very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned.